So welcome. Um, if this looks right to you, women in global health exploring non-academic careers, you're in the, the right place and the right day. Uh, so welcome to our, uh, our seminar series. I am Dr. Anna Kalbarczyk. I'm the Assistant Director of the Johns Hopkins Center for Global Health um, and the lucky individual who gets to lead this EDGE initiative within the center. So welcome, happy to have you all here. As you come in, please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat, maybe add your LinkedIn information, connect with others, but make sure that you're selecting everyone in the chat so that your messages are seen, not just by uh, me and Heidi, but by everyone who's here so that you can uh, do that connecting. I know for some of you, the ongoing chat, sharing LinkedIn's, et cetera, is distracting. So if this is the case for you, just close that chat box during the seminar and maybe bring it back up during the Q&A. And finally, speaking of Q&A, please make sure you put those questions in the Q&A box and not in the chat directly. So it's much easier for us to find those questions, make sure we get them answered if they are in that Q&A box. Before we get started, just a few reminders of ways to join our EDGE community. You're here today for our regular seminar series, so um, that's one way. And um, I'll be sharing at the end of our uh, of our series, a, a save the date for our next session in November. We've also got a virtual network on Slack with almost a thousand members. Uh, we keep growing after every seminar. So if you're not already with us, please do join. And Megan will be posting a, a link to join us in Slack in the chat. Um, and then we also have an upcoming course in January, Essential Skills for Women Leadership in Global Health. So if this sounds of interest to you, you can always reach out and we can give you more information and that will be running January 9th through the 13th. It's a virtual synchronous course that you can take for credit or not for credit. You don't have to be a Hopkins student or Hopkins affiliate even to take it. Um, and this course and its material has been developed based on lessons learned from this community and from speakers like the one we are featuring today, Dr. Heidi Larson. So with that, let me uh, introduce our speaker and then uh, turn it over to Heidi to share her story. So Heidi is a professor of anthropology and director of the Vaccine Confidence Project at the, school, the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and the University of Washington. She previously headed global immunization communication at UNICEF and chaired Gavi's advocacy task force as well. Uh, her research focuses on the analysis of social and political factors that can affect the uptake of health interventions and influence policies. But given that we're here today to hear about Dr. Larson's leadership journey, I'm going to stop my introduction there, stop sharing my screen, uh, turn off my video, and turn it over to her to um, tell us about her leadership journey in global health. Heidi, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks uh, so much, Anna, and hello, everybody. Um, well, I've been uh, encouraged to take a more storytelling approach rather than slides, which I'm happy to do because I do a lot of slides these days, particularly since COVID. Um, but I'll talk uh, a little bit about uh, chronologically how I got to where I am today. Um, I have to say from a leadership perspective, I certainly didn't start my path or even halfway through to be a leader. Um, it was, I just actually was doing what I cared about and I kept on doing it and I kept uh, moving through it. So um, not there's nothing wrong with aspiring towards leadership, um, but sometimes it has to grow. Um, and you have to grow your following and, and your interests. I think the um, one of the most important things through my path has been really sticking to something I cared about. Um, not what, you know, not who gave me a bigger pension or health benefits or whatever, which um, of course, as you get older, you think about that more. Um, but I think that it's really important to follow your heart. Um, I started, uh, I did a, I was going to be a biomedical engineer because I absolutely loved physics and math. But at the same time, I wanted to have some people interaction and I thought health was important. So I was going to do this combination of an MD and a, and a 
um, and engineering degree, biomedical engineering. I, um, I found myself much more attracted to the physics, but also social sciences. Um, I found the kind of pre-med environment pretty, um, very uh, competitive in in a way that I felt like I don't, I didn't, didn't like it. <laughs> actually, I liked the content of the courses, but not. I felt like it wasn't really for me. Um, so I migrated more into social sciences, keeping a real interest in health, um, but much more from the social perspective. And I was at Harvard and I managed to get, uh, to my surprise, a fellowship when they gave to a few people, uh, a special fellowship that gave you a year of uh, resources to travel and explore interests that you wouldn't otherwise have had the opportunity to do. Uh, and I had I had a particular interest in in children and and uh, children's play behavior. My undergraduate uh, thesis was about Down syndrome children, and I spent a year doing uh, school ethnography of how five Down syndrome children were integrating into the school. And I saw that there were so many ways that play was a way that um, they found ways to communicate with people different from them. Um, and my, the fellowship I got was to look at that in a lot of different cultural settings. So I, I had a real interest too in minorities and, uh, and di diversity. And, and I ended up in Israel for a year with Palestinian uh, and Israeli kids and, and looking at how that played out in the playground. Uh, and then I worked in the West Bank in Gaza. My fellowship was running out. Um, and I started to do some work with uh, Save the Children in the West Bank and, and Gaza. And then Save the Children was opening up uh, a new program in Nepal. And they said, you want to come and work with us there. And, and India and Nepal were the next place I wanted to go. So I was really thrilled. Um, and sometimes, um, you know, uh, you get lucky. I mean, I feel like I've been very lucky um, at times, but you also have to be open to luck um, because you can have so, you know, such a fixed sense of where you want to be at a certain point that you miss opportunities. So it's really important to keep your, your eyes open, to keep doing what you're doing. But if something comes along that could open a whole new world for you, um, it's important to not be too rigid with where you think you wanted to go because maybe at the end of the day, there are other things that evolve. So I think that's something that I really learned. Uh, so I ended up in Nepal uh, for what was initially like a six month consultancy type thing to work with them setting up their program, which with Save the Children, what they do is they do community profiles, and, and that's how they build interest and a following and support. Um, but then I really fell in love with Nepal. I just thought it was just, there was something magical about it to me. And I, uh, I went to the UNICEF office because I had my, my work had all been about childhood and, and adolescence. And uh, I, you know, the only other organization I could think of uh, to go talk to was UNICEF. Um, and they said, okay, well, what can you do for us? And I told them that I've been doing a bit of work with Save the Children. And then I said, but actually before that, I worked uh, with Down syndrome children. And they said, um, well, well, that's great because next year is the International Year of the Disabled Child. We need a, a person that's the point person for the Year of the Disabled Child. So actually that was another kind of lucky coincidence. But again, I didn't come to Nepal planning to spend um, as much time there as I did. And, and that also is something to, um, it wasn't just another six month consultancy they had, this was for a year. Um, and so I said, yeah, okay, great. Um, and then that built into a three year, I ended up living in Nepal for three years. And that's during the time that, and, and it became part of the regional um, India and Nepal, that, that whole regional effort of 
looking at how uh, disability in childhood, and this was broader than Down syndrome, it was, there was a lot of ear and eye infections and um, mental health was really, they said that they didn't really have that problem, but in fact, they did, they just didn't, didn't deal with it. Um, and that was something that we tried to kind of explore and try to figure out ways to help acknowledge and, and build some attention to that out. Um, but it was during that time that I uh, found myself turning more and more to anthropologists because uh, here we, I was in this development agency um, and I would see sometimes people flying in from New York, like, let's start a women's microcredit program. And I would say, well, you know, it's not like women have a whole lot of free time here. They're working 24 seven between harvesting rice in the field, you know, cooking for everybody, um, cleaning, um, doing a lot of manual labor sometimes uh, and raising kids. Um, and so I said, you know, we've got to think about if we want them to start a microcredit project where they can start a small business or something, we also need to be thinking about how can we help them get their kids taken care of and how can, um, and, and I increasingly turned to anthropologists and I found that that contextual um, issue was really important. And there were a number of things I saw in international development where they would come up with a great idea like uh, they uh, had uh, putting toilets in a lot of places, particularly in some of these developing countries, you know, they would, that was the field, you know? And so they, um, the German government came in and made all these um, toilets in separate booths and they all got trashed down by the village. And we thought, well, what's that about? Um, but they hadn't talked to the villagers because actually the villagers said, why are you putting these walls up and these smelly places and it's better in the air and it's more pure and it's more. Um, so it, it took kind of listening to the community and understanding and one saying, well, why is this important? You know, the fact that um, you know, diseases are spread and, and all kinds of different things that actually they had a very different, what they were seeing versus what the development people were thinking about was quite different. So I ended up um, after being pretty much out of, out of the US for, for close to five years between Israel and, um, and then a, a bit of a journey to Nepal and, and then working there, um, I decided to go start applying to, to graduate schools to do a degree in anthropology. Um, I was, I did think about different things like uh, public health or global health or um, different kinds of um, subjects and that I was told some of the best advice I got was develop one expertise because you know global health, international health need a lot of different expertise. And if your if your area is you know uh, international health more generally, um, it's general. And what has been really helpful to me, and I know some of my other colleagues is you, you want to get that experience to the, to the experience or education, depending on what, but it is really important, particularly when it comes to leadership, if you've developed some expertise, either a focus in an area or a particular skill, whether it's for some people, it was more um, business and economics or management for health systems. Uh, for me, I was more interested in the social cultural piece other people like statisticians and mathematical modelers. Um, there's people coming from psychology, from political science, that's also important. Um, and we've been increasing. I mean, look, if you look at the role that politics played in, um, uh, in the COVID response, uh, that's also an important. So developing something that's a bit of your own uh, is, is important. 
um, while you know being able to work across you know with others. That that's really important. Um, so I uh, did my PhD. I ended up at Berkeley, um, which I was very happy about. Uh, they had some really good anthropologists working in legal anthropology and social anthropology and medical anthropology. Um, and uh, during that time, I um, uh, I've, I focused again on uh, children's play, but I was going to do my field work on um, Muslim and Hindu children in, in India and got my funding, got my research uh, approved. Um, uh, but I, uh, I ended up having to wait a long time for a, a visa to do this in India. And my advisor said, you need a plan B, maybe plan C because we've got people getting old in this department waiting for research visas in India. So I, and they said, you can look at this same phenomena in diaspora communities. And there's plenty of different countries around the world where you can find that. And I ended up um, after studying up on the various diaspora communities around the world, um, I ended up in London actually in a, in a very urban setting, but there was a very large um, settlement of an originally Sikh uh, community, but with partition in India, when Pakistan and India split, um, uh, there was a, a religious partition, partici sorry, partition also. Uh, but in London, actually, it was interesting because those communities that had to go to different sides ended up in the same community because of a common language in, in Punjabi. So I ended up in this community looking at how the kids who had come from the Pakistan side and the ones on the Indian side and how they were all through their play. So it was really um, fascinating work. Um, and then I went back to Berkeley to write up my dissertation and I, I handed it all in and I passed. And actually, by the way, after I handed in my PhD, I got a brown envelope with a string around it from the Indian government say, you're welcome to come and do your research and here's your research visa. So I'm glad I didn't wait for that. So that's another important thing. Um, sometimes you can uh, listen to the advice of, of others that really helped me a lot. Um, and, uh, and I was going to go back to the field. I was, I really, you know, wanted to go back to whether it was UNICEF or other international organizations, because I loved being out there in countries um, in a very practical way. And I didn't really do my PhD actually to go into academia. And for those of you considering a PhD, um, if you're not thinking about going into academia as a professor or researcher, you don't necessarily need a PhD. I think sometimes a master's can be a strong enough skill base and experience in the field. But I was doing it not so much thinking about my next job, but thinking about the opportunity to pursue um, research in an area that I was really interested in. The kind of time to, to follow something you're really interested in that you don't get in, your day, in a day job. Um, but anyway, I, I finished my PhD thinking to go back to some country, <laughs> depending on where I had the opportunity. But um, after my exam, I got called into the dean's office, uh, the School of Education, who was one of my examiners. Um, and he said, you know, this isn't, I know, in your career plan, but I was just appointed to be the head of education at Apple Computers. And I think the kind of work you're doing could be really helpful to us because and this is giving away my age here, but they said, we're just starting a program, one computer per classroom. Um, but we're getting a lot of resistance from the teachers. Teachers are threatened by the computers. They don't want them in there. So we'd love to have you do some classroom ethnography in a number of classrooms in the Los Angeles area. Um, and, and I thought, yeah, well, that's definitely not what I was thinking about doing. But I did like the idea of looking at um, how technology comes into societies and how 
that that um, interface. So I thought, well, I'll do that. Uh, the Bay Area, the Silicon Valley was not far from Berkeley. I would stay based in Berkeley and going down from time to time to these schools. Um, but then I started to get a bit more embedded in Silicon Valley and the Xerox Research Center started getting interest in this area of uh, anthropology. There was one other anthropologist who was doing a project on technology in airplanes and she sat in a lot of cockpits and did a lot of, but I was working on some of the new, newer technologies. And I did that for a couple years and it was fascinating work, but I really missed what I was really hoping to do, which was to go um, back um, overseas. So I, I actually went in my work with UNICEF, I asked them if we, I could look at UNICEF headquarters as one of the sites for some of their technology studies and they loved that idea. So that's how I started to get back in um, and then I ended up being asked to go to the South Pacific for six years. Now, I didn't, when they asked me that, I said, what is UNICEF doing in the South Pacific? You know, it's a place for people to go on holiday, but they said, actually, there's a lot of issues. Um, and I was particularly asked to work with 13 Pacific Island countries to get them to ratify the Convention on the Rights of the Child. And they said, why we think you're the right person for this is that there's a lot of cultural um, resistance and they're, they're very hierarchical societies that uh, don't think that children should have rights that that's you know um, they have their needs but they you know this is children need to respect elders and so that was i hadn't thought of it that way and actually in addition there were very high adolescent suicide rates um, there were pockets of malaria in some of the island countries worse than, than Africa. There were other ones that don't have um, uh, fertile ground, some of the coral ones that had serious eye deficiency problems. So it was a really uh, fascinating time. Um, but then um, you start to think of your, I had been out there for quite a while and thought that it was time to get closer to home again. And I accepted a position at WHO in Geneva. Um, one of the things that I had started to do a lot more of during my time in the South Pacific, it was when AIDS was just going, traveling the world. And because I had been working on adolescent health um, and, and increasingly sexual and reproductive health as part of the whole agenda there. Um, I got more and more involved in the AIDS response and health. And um, there was a position that opened up in WHO that was uh, incommunicable diseases, but particularly looking at TB and HIV. And I thought it would get me closer to the US. My parents were getting older. These, these are the kinds of things you start to think about. <laughs> the more you get older, you have other things that matter. Um, and uh, that was really an eye-opening time. Um, I didn't really like working at WHO, to be honest. I mean, I'm being very honest here. I'm glad I did it because I got an understanding um, of uh, how things worked. <laughs> I, I think I might have had a very different experience if I'd worked in a WHO office in one of the countries I'd worked in before because at least you're kind of in the field, but I, um, I don't know, I, I felt it a bit too removed from the reality of life on the ground. And maybe that was just because of my own preferences and experiences, but, um, but then UNICEF asked me to come back because um, they said, well, your experience at WHO now is really important to us because we're about to launch this new global initiative called GAVI, the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunization. And we'd like you to work with our executive director, who's going to be the new chair of the Global Alliance, and that you work with her, but also launch the global initiative and lead the advocacy and communicate strategy work uh, in cooperation with the other partners, um, which were WHO, um, uh, World Bank, uh, uh, 
Rockefeller Foundation, Gates Foundation, uh, those were the main ones at the time. Um, and so I did that and moved back to New York. And I, I was, what was interesting to me about it, I thought vaccines would be a bit boring, frankly, after working in AIDS, which was so engaging. It involved all of society. There was so much energy in the AIDS response. And vaccines seem much more, uh, less, less exciting <laughs> from, a, from a, you know, culture of social di diversity point of view. But actually, um, it turned out to be a really interesting time to come into vaccines. I thought the partnership aspect was really interesting, trying to think about it in different ways, introducing new vaccines, not the typical ones. Um, and what I didn't realize at the time is that I was coming in at another important time in the vaccine area, which is getting to where I am now, which was um, we were having quite a changed world in terms of communication, in terms of um, uh, technology. And during the five years I was at UNICEF headquarters, but traveling a lot around the world for this, um, the rollout of these new vaccines, as I ended up dealing more and more with, in fact, I got a nickname, the director of UNICEF's fire department, um, more and more places in the world where there were small and large issues where children, uh, sorry, communities, sometimes government individuals or outspoken individuals were starting to question and refuse some of the new vaccines. And UNICEF wasn't in, used to having the good things they wanted to deliver be questioned by publics and not just questioned, but sometimes overtly, don't bring us those. We don't want those new vaccines. So I started to see this trend coming up, um, but a lot of people didn't want to hear it, uh, particularly in the immunization community. They said, you're being too negative, focus on the positive stuff. I said, well, I, I, I believe in vaccines. I'm not being negative because I'm uh, a negative person, but I've got frontline experience here and this is a growing problem. Um, and I, Within UNICEF, um, particularly the executive director, who was Carol Bellamy at the time, uh, got it. She, they understood and they said, well, take a bit of your time. You can work a little bit on that. But there were so many other things that I had to do that I felt like this is really a full-time job. So I left UNICEF. Uh, everybody thought I was crazy um, because I had a really good job and you know, what was I gonna do about my pension? And I said, listen, if at my age, I'm worried about my pension and not something I care about, <laughs> um, you know, what's the point? And um, I um, had a, a fellowship for a year at Harvard in the um, Center for Population and Development to start to do some research on this topic. And then I realized it was such a big area that I started to put together a proposal to the Gates Foundation and got money to start um, the Vaccine Confidence Project, which I launched in 2010. And I can tell you, I got a lot of resistance many, many times. People told me these are access problems. There's just a few crazy people on the edges. Um, you know, you're, uh, don't talk too much about it. You're gonna cause more questions. Uh, it, it's, it, there's been a lot of resistance along the way, but somehow I really felt like we need to get ahead of this. This is really growing. And then in the meanwhile, um, I mean, I started this in 2010, but people forget that Facebook, Twitter, uh, you know, a lot of these platforms just started in, in 2006, 2007, 2008. Um, and that became this whole other, um, what can you say, an uh, amplifier of all these concerns uh, globally. So my timing um, was uh, fortunate and unfortunate. <laughs> um, but at any rate, in the meanwhile, there's been a lot more recognition of these issues. WHO established a working group on vaccine hesitancy, which I was there about 10 of us. We worked together to start to map it out and look at it. 
Um, and then we developed at the, in where I'm based at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, together with the University of Washington in Seattle, started to develop a vaccine confidence index because one of the big questions I kept getting from people was how big of a problem is this? Is it getting worse? Because I realized to have any impact either on policy or funding, people want numbers. They want to know the scope and scale of things. Um, so in 2015, established a vaccine confidence index and uh, we've been monitoring over time. So we had a lot of background data on vaccine confidence before COVID hit. And that's been hugely helpful for our regional monitoring in, in different regions. Uh, we monitor uh, for WHO in the, in the Asia Pacific region, for the EU in Europe, uh, in Africa, we partner with Africa CDC. And in all of these cases, all that data that we had has been really helpful to see the impact of COVID on vaccine confidence and others. So um, we're expanding. We've learned a lot about vaccines, but we're also seeing a lot of the reasons that people accept or refuse vaccines is, um, uh, is very relevant to cooperation with other health interventions. We saw that in a big way in, in COVID. Um, so just getting back to the, and in the meanwhile, um, I've been kind of almost <laughs> surprised along the way people are contacting me as a leader in this field. Um, and I, I kind of became a leader in this field on, only kind of in a way being told by so many people that you know you're, you're leading in this area. And then, and you need to, uh, uh, how can I say, establish that leadership in a different way. And I had some very helpful peers who, who helped me get a team set up and expand on that to build our visual presence. Um, I had to give a lot more talks. Um, the other thing that made a big difference is that I, I wrote a book um, called Stuck, How Vaccine Rumors Start and Why They Don't Go Away, which really reflects on the last 10 years of a lot of the learnings, but in a very, um, some of you may or may not have seen it, but it's, it's in a popular science mode. So it's meant for the general public and that's really uh, helped. Um, it's kind of like a, you know, <laughs> I don't know, something you can refer to. Um, but just cause I, I know I wanna give some time for, for questions. Um, follow your heart is really important, really, really important because you have to live with what you do. Um, and to whatever extent, and sometimes I needed to get, uh, do some other jobs on the side to support my passion, so to speak. Um, and sometimes I had to take grants that we would do just to help feed the, the work because it, it, it was very hard to get um, funding in an area because people were a bit nervous about this topic as it got more and more kind of toxic. Um, the other thing that is in the meanwhile, I, I have built, um, I've done a lot of mentoring um, and I didn't really have a particular mentor when I was, I turned to different people along the way um, and some, you know, were, saw what I was doing and came to me and said, listen, this could help you. And sometimes I would turn to others. Um, and sometimes it's not about having one mentor, but just having people you can start to turn to. Um, and one thing that's really important is keeping good relationships with people. Even if you have a difficult time with someone along your path, you never ever know when that person is gonna show up again in your life. There were a few times in my early working days where you, know, you just got so frustrated with someone, you wanted to, you almost, never never work with them again or whatever, but you need to kind of swallow your pride sometimes and, and keep a chin up um, and keep working because, you know, these are people that may be reviewing your proposals, may be interviewing you for jobs, they may be doing other things later in your life that you never thought about. Um, so it's really important to keep good relations with people. 
Um, not with, you know, you don't have to do it with everyone, but try not to instill any bad blood, bad blood, as they say along the way, because it's just not, it's not helpful in the long run. I'm not, I think it's important to surround yourself by people with shared values that you respect and support you absolutely in your closer circle, but try not to alienate people along the way because it's not a productive thing. Um, and I've had many occasions with my work that I got so frustrated with people who kept telling me, you know, I'm, I shouldn't be doing this, I shouldn't be doing this, you know, you're, I'm undermining uh, the good work of other people by saying that it's not, you know, it needs attention. Um, but I think it's, it's really important to surround yourself by with people, seek mentors. Um, and, and also it's important to find people that help you not just open doors, but um, give you space at tables to, to talk um, about what you care about what, and, and to speak up. I mean, I, it took me a long time to speak up in a forum. I would often defer to other people. I grew up in a very different, time when you know you you did I defer to your elders a lot more than I think the environment is today and partly because of social media and there's a much more horizontal type of communication rather than vertical but um, I, it, learning to speak up is really important uh, especially if it's something you care about it's much easier to speak up when you care about something that's another reason to stick with stuff that matters to you um, um, Anna, I, I, I could talk more, but I really want to hear from people um, and be able to answer any questions. Um, yeah, great. Thank you so much, Heidi, um, for, for sharing so much of your, of your journey. And we've got some questions uh, queued up in the Q&A here. Um, you know, but I, I, maybe I just wanted to lift up something you said there at the end, the importance of keeping good relationships with people, right? Because uh, these people will be interviewing you or working with you or partnering with you or, or whatever it is. And, uh, you know, throughout the edge work, we've talked a lot about networks, the importance of networks, but really how networking can be about relationship formation um, and maintenance. And here in uh, Baltimore, we often call it small to more because you run into people all of the time. Um, and it's been really interesting in my own career how I've seen global health be exactly the same way. You don't know where in the world you'll be, but you'll run into people um, and those relationships can really help you. And, and you can also use that relationship to help someone else too, right? That it can be a real win-win situation. Um, you know, I so one of the things that was really interesting to me, Heidi, you talked a lot about the different jobs that you had over time. And I'd be interested to hear you talk maybe a little bit about some of your decision-making process when going from one job to another? You know, like what, what factors did you really value when you saw it was time to leave one position for another or what facilitated that decision-making for you? Um, well, I think, uh, one, it was opportunities that I wasn't, it wasn't really in my plan that at one point I would change from X to Y, it was, you know, these opportunities that came up, like Save the Children saying, well, are you open to going to another country? Um, so being being open to that. And um, the, the shift to um, uh, going into academia, or at least going for a PhD, really, um, again, when I went to Nepal, I wasn't thinking about going to graduate school at the time. I, I didn't want to go to, this is another thing too. I mean, graduate school is, it's a lot of work and it's, it's a lonelier journey than being an undergraduate because it's much more focused. Um, I think a master's is, it still has a bit more of a social element, but a PhD is a pretty lonely journey. It's about your work, what you do and your supervisor. And you might have some classes, but you might not. Um, in the UK, you don't have any courses. It's it's about you and your supervisor, and you can go to classes, but it's not part of the curriculum. So, um, you know, I didn't want to get into that path without really knowing what I wanted, what path I wanted. 
Um, so that was really more out of seeing, you know, that I would bring a lot more to the field of international development if I had my, if I had the opportunity to be trained as an anthropologist and bring that skill back to my global health work. Um, I have found that having a foot in both worlds has been really helpful. I mean, in, in what I do, it doesn't mean that, you know, for other people, but if you do have a, a bit of um, specialized training, it, it is helpful. Um, and I find even for academia, a lot of my students really are grateful for the fact that I have been in the field and I do have some practical experience and I'm not just speaking from books, um, which is, is fine for certain subjects, but for the nature of the work we do and for global health, it, having some of that on the ground experience is, is really important and it, and, and it really has been helpful to students. So that's, um, th that's been very motivating for me anyway. Thank you. Um, Becky has a question that you mentioned that your peers helped you own leadership in your field. Can you speak more about how they did this and also the reasons why you didn't necessarily see yourself in that way? Um, I guess I was just, I was so focused on, you know, the work and the issues. Um, and at one point, you know, I had, I really had my head down on this vaccine um, confidence building piece, partly because not everybody agreed with the need for it. And so I found a few people that, you know, were in sync with me and we just soldiered on. Um, and then at, at one point, I, I just kind of looked up and around and I realized that, you know, people were starting to say, actually, she's onto something. Um, not everybody. I to this day, I have people who say this is more about access, you know, you're wasting our time, um, you're amplifying it by talking about it. <laughs> um, but uh, COVID helped a little bit in the sense of people saw that this was really a challenge. Um, yeah, I it was really, um, and then I felt like, well, it's okay to talk. It, it gave me strength to be able to be more public about it because frankly, um, I just didn't want to deal with all the resistance that was partly keeping my head down. But as people started to see the value of it, that's when I started to speak up more. Um, but um, the other thing is to, to build a group of people around you with a shared, um, I mean, this was one of the things in the, in the, um, the title of, of this session and uh, knowing your public, really listening to what's going on around you and more and more, but also building a group of people around you that have shared interests, that, that can be a mutual support group. Um, and also when you do get more into a leadership or management role, I find that some people try to keep people around them at a lower level because they wanna be in control, <laughs> so to speak. But I have really, um, I really try to surround myself with people who um, will challenge me, are smart, who are uh, maybe don't have a lot of qualifications, but they really have a passion about something and will challenge me. And I think it makes a stronger, me a stronger person, but also um, then builds a community of people who, uh, carry on the work, so to speak. Thank you for um, for talking about community and also how it's important to build that community uh, across different levels, right? And that we can do it in, in different ways as well. Um, Sandra asks, how did you decide between academia versus non-academia? Do you feel like we're getting to a time where people can really work in both? Um, well, I... Um... I guess I haven't had to decide in the sense of I am, I do have a foot in both. And when I left UNICEF, what, one of the things I said to UNICEF was, uh, you're not done with me. <laughs> I'm basically going off piste here now to spend some 
time getting an evidence base, getting a research base here that can be a resource to UNICEF and a resource to WHO and to governments that I heard people needed to understand better. Um, but that because I didn't have the, the time and the context to do that inside, and actually it didn't happen immediately, but now um, a lot of the relationships I had built in my UNICEF role have been really important to keep alive. And I do work with WHO a lot with UNICEF. In fact, next year, uh, the 2023 State of the World Children's Report is going to have the theme on immunization. And they've come back to me and they've said, listen, we realize at this point we cannot do a theme issue on this topic without having a section on confidence and, and the whole hesitancy issue. Can you, and you've got all this data now. And so we're going to be doing a global map for them and working uh, with them on that. So you can have a foot in both worlds. I'm sitting in academia, but a lot of our projects are with UNICEF and with WHO and with, you know, governments. Africa CDC, the EU. Um, so you, you can have a foot in both worlds. I think really connected to that, though, um, Brianna is asking, you know, in a traditional academic environment, productivity is measured through journal publications, yes. you know, tenure, etc. So how has this played into your career? And are there any other metrics you think we should prioritize? And maybe I'll, I'll tap into that and say, you know, for people looking to either transition into academia who don't have publications, right? Or, or looking to transfer out of academia into practice, you know, what, what are the different metrics or outputs or things that, that you have to consider there? Because I, I think that can be- yeah, really that's, It's a really good question. And it was, it was, a hard, it was hard for me, actually. I, I did manage to be a co-author on a couple publications while I was in the field. Because um, I did like to keep, even if I wasn't in an academic institution, in whatever country I was with, with UNICEF in particular, I would always turn to the local university, the University of the South Pacific, the universities in some of the, partly to get local insights, but it was important, I thought, to keep that exchange of, of knowledge going on. Um, but when I did decide to make the full transition, that was, um, I had a lot of catching up to do. And there were a lot of people there who had, you know, that's all they had done was publications, publications. So um, it was, you know, I had to work at both ends of the candle, as they say, um, and have managed to put out a lot of publications. But again, the more you can do that as a team, the better. Um, but it, yeah, it was hard. And the metrics are very much um, on, on publications. Although it's starting to change a little bit. I think the US is frankly a bit more open than Europe in terms of the, um, the impact, um, not just the publication, but the policy impact. Um, there is this new thing that's relatively new alt metric, which is not just a measure of how many times your paper has been cited in other peer reviewed papers, but what's the, what's the media, social media uptake of what you're doing. Um, so there's some little things, but you know, in addition to that within academia for me, I had to, where I did have to make a choice was, am I in an, I'm, you know, either you go into the anthropology field because anthropologists have very different metrics than public health people. Um, but I realized at one point that if I'm going to have an impact in public health, um, I shouldn't be writing in anthropology journals because I don't know many people in certainly the medical or public health field who would get past the title in some anthropology articles. So I had to make a choice there. The whole style of writing is different. Um, it's much more, you know, multi-author in, in social sciences and anthropology are expected to be a sole author um, on a, as, as a metric. And so I would be on papers then in science that had like, you know, five to 20 authors sometimes. Some of the, my work with the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, we've got tens of sometimes a hundred um, collaborators around the world. 
So even within academia, you have to make choices. You, um, Heidi, you're doing such a beautiful job of segueing in between the questions. I don't even have to, to work too hard as a moderator um, because Gatwiri was asking a, a question around um, you know, social sciences. So she says, I'm, I'm really glad social sciences is forging ahead in non-conventional careers. Uh, she's got a background in sociology, science and medicine, but now population health management um, as she studies in Johns Hopkins. So what approaches did you use from anthropology to map out your background? You know, did you consider social determinants of health and effective technology within the context of your data? You know, how have you leveraged some of your experience as an anthropologist throughout your career? Well, I think it, our work, the Vaccine Confidence Project is very issue focused and my team is very multidisciplinary. I've got psychology, mathematical modeling, computer scientists, um, anthropologists, epidemiologists, vaccinologists, a political scientist. And, but what we have together is our focus on a problem, our focus on, you know, how are we gonna, for those who question and refuse vaccines, you know, how can we bring different insights to understand this issue and also to design interventions to deal with it. Um, so in that sense, I bring questions from a social and cultural perspective. Um, I, the social determinants of health to me is not about social, it's about economics. If you look at all the work, it's very much about um, what we call slow data. It's about um, you know, what economic strata people are in and, and this, obviously there are social, social implications of the economics of it. But it's not really about social and cultural, the, the more volatile and, and changing things. And we've, I've just launched with the Lancet, well, launched it on the eve of COVID and it was parked for a while, but we're um, building it up now. It's called the Emotional Determinants of Health Commission. Um, and I think that's gonna, it's one of the things that I've seen has really been um, absent in an analysis because uh, I certainly when I started with UNICEF we would have a KPI the K knowledge attitude KAP studies knowledge attitudes and practice studies uh, that you could have it sitting on the shelf you'd be referring that for a couple of years and these days you know they could last a month or two um, and we've seen and I've written some papers on the volatility of confidence and it's not just about vaccines and it's very emotive. People are in a very different place. I mean, some of it's to do with social media and fast changing and viral uh, emotions. Um, so I, I'm really looking forward to that commission and that too, I'm, I'll be bringing much more of an, an anthropological cultural because also culture, um, how people express emotions is is and how they affect their health decision is quite different culturally. So I've had a number of my friends um, whose children, you know, they'll call me and they say, oh my God, my daughter or my son wants to go into anthropology. Will they ever get a decent job? <laughs> and I've assured them that they're, I said, you know, if there's one field that if you study, no matter what you do, it's gonna bring value is anthropology because it's all about listening and understanding people. And that's a huge asset for whatever you do. <laughs> I like that. You know, one thing I appreciate too, Heidi, is that, that we've talked about in this network before is how we frame our skills, right? So you don't even have to frame it as an anthropologist. You can like dig in and think about what are those skills you have. Listening is really absolutely critical. All right, I've got two more questions for you. Swati says, thank you so much for your insightful session. And she appreciates you being uh, so honest about your struggles and your journey. She's asking, can you please elaborate upon your experience with research support in different countries? Like how conducive was the environment? How did you overcome any setbacks in different contexts? And any advice for budding researchers in this regard? I'm not, I'm not sure what, what she means by research support. Is that funding or is it collaboration or is it, um, uh, uh, not sure what there are many things in different countries. I mean, right now I've, I've I've built out a kind of more of a research network. I mean, when it was me and myself, I 
you know, you, you do your field methods and you build it up. But right now I work with teams in a number of settings. Um, it's important to involve local um, counterparts. They always help with navigating, um, you know, the systems. Um, but I'm not sure if she's asking about funding or, um, or collaboration or what aspect of support. Uh, well, if Swati is still around, uh, please, you can add to the chat. Well, keep us going uh, with our last question. Karen says, what advice do you have for non-white female early career academics so that people will listen? Well, I would like to believe that they listen because of what you have to say, not what you're... <laughs> um, uh, whether gender or, or ethnicity um, uh, should be in the way, although that's, I know that that's a challenge sometimes, but I think really doing what you do well, um, people will listen when you have something to say and, and you need to speak up and you need to have an angle and an opinion and an expertise. Um, that's what's gonna make a difference. Um, and I know, Depend, I mean, I certainly know as a, as a female researcher in a lot of countries where women are not really um, given a lot of space to speak, um, that, you know, you do have to find allies that, that help support you and, and help give you that space. But I think it's being really good at what you do is going to be really important. Maybe I can just add to that, you know, I've, I've noticed, um, I, I, or I, what I appreciate is saying, speak up, right? And, and one, I do think we have to be, be in and create safe spaces uh, for younger women and uh, earlier career investigators to speak up. But I also think there's a, a large hesitancy that I see in people to speak up. Um, and I, you know, I know that, uh, among my teams, I really want to hear what everyone has to say and really try to encourage that. And I think, um, you know, sometimes trying to get over that hesitancy and be in spaces, uh, you know, where where early career women can can speak up can be really important. Um, Heidi, we've reached the the end of our session, so I I just want to thank you so much for spending your time with us today, um, and for telling us about your leadership journey and the work that you do. I'm gonna share my screen really quickly as we wrap up just to, um, to share this save the date for our next session. So we'll be meeting again on November 17th with Dr. Alice Chu, who will be talking about her own leadership journey. So please mark your calendars and join us. Um, and then also, you know, for those of you who would like to continue engaging with EDGE and the network, please join us on Slack uh, where you'll find all of our weekly updates, more information about these seminars and how to stay involved. Heidi, thank you again so much for spending your time with us today. Uh, good luck with your jet lag. Uh, I'm sure, <laughs> sure you'll get over it soon. And thank you again. Great. Thanks so much. Cheers.